Ellen Sonata really well because I recently gave a speech on it. Oh, you did? Oh, uh, yeah. So the concert, I gave an opening speech for my friend. So I had to research the history of it. I had to research the composer, everything about the movements. I I had to dig deep for this thing. Uh, let me see. What's another piece I know really well? Uh, I'm trying to think. What is a piece I know, like, uh, off the tip of my... Oh, Symphonie Fantastique. I know Symphonie Fantastique. Really? Okay, I'll try it. That thing is a long one, though. Um, I know, I know Symphony Fantastique because that one is like a standard everyone learns in music appreciation. Mm. <clears throat> All right, sure, yeah, we'll uh, check that one out. Let me uh, do a good opening stream here. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's going to be a very short stream tonight. Hello, hello. How are you all doing? I hope you're all doing wonderful. Tonight, we will be having Lord Horatio. Hey. <laughs> we will be doing a good old music review, and we shall we shall be, uh, well, just re reviewing what the uh, musicians do and what the pieces are, and we shall put our good old filter on and see how this goes. Hey. So I... Mm, I I would I would recommend for this one maybe we should talk about a uh, a Caesar Frank's violin sonata. I mean we can do Symphony Fantastique. Um, I'll let you pick though which one you want to talk about. Sure. Let's see. Do you want? Uh, let's do the one you you would you like to do? Would you wait? Would you like to continue with? Um. Well, you and. Uh... Actually, you know what? You and I just spent uh, like a whole hour talking about Caesar Frank. Well, let, we can do a uh, Berlioz's uh, Symphony Fantastique. Sure, all right. Yeah, this one. Oh, uh, uh, this one's a pretty. This one's a pretty good one. Um, can you see my my screen? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, yeah. What's the I I um uh Symphony. Just type symphony, and then fantastique. There, 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 there. Um, uh, the second one. This one. Yeah. This one. Okay, so a few background on this piece. So it is a programmatic, uh, symphony. Uh, that means that this was a um, piece of music written with an actual program which depicted a story. So each movement is going to depict a story. And uh, someone, or I can't remember if Berlioz himself wrote this program or if someone wrote it for him, but during the performance, the people would receive this um, program. And I think I actually have... Let me see if I can get the original program. Let's see. Program notes. Let me see. Berlioz. Berlioz. Hector Berlioz. If you know the story of this piece, it's kind of gruesome. Really? Please okay. Okay, so this piece was um, written in inspiration of a certain girl that Berlioz liked. He, uh, it was an, I think she was an actor, if I remember correctly. And what she would do... Or what he did is that he wrote this piece in hopes that she would listen to it and it would uh, make her fall in love with him. Um, to some extent, it worked. They eventually got married, but um, the marriage was completely terrible. And I wouldn't expect any less from Hector Berlioz because he was not a good man. <laughs> Barely else was a garbage human being. Oh my, alright. 
Uh, so this piece, uh, Symphony Fantastique, was written while uh, Berlioz was under the influence of drugs, and that's pretty much what this symphony is about. An artist uh, uh, hallucinating on drugs. Well, you heard it here, chat. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's see. It's all. Uh, no, I can't. Well, I mean, I can see seashells, but I can't see a. Uh... Shoot! Let me uh, let me stop streaming. Let me go. Let's let me go to share screen. Symphony. I'm trying to get the original program, so we can read it off, so that um. See it or no? Um, <clears throat> let me see. Yeah, are you ready to play it? Uh, yes. Which one? First, second. Uh, let's do, let's do the second one. This one? Yeah. Almost an hour long. Let's do it. Yeah, it is a long piece. Um, I may have to go to Wikipedia to get the, the original notes of the program. Oh, wait, hold, oh, wait, no, here it is. All right, so, um, okay, cool, I got the original program, I think. So I can pause it or no? Uh, yes. So, we are going to listen to the first movement, and here, and I think this is how it was. This is the uh, paragraphs that would have been given to us if we, were, uh, if we were an audience in 1830 when this was first premiered. I think we would have received this. So, the author imagines that a young musician afflicted by the sickness of spirit which a famous writer has called the vagueness of passions, sees for the first time a woman who unites all the charms of the ideal person his imagination was dreaming of and falls desperately in love with her. By a strange anomaly, the beloved image never presents itself to the artist's mind without being associated with a musical idea in which he recognizes the, a certain quality of passion but endowed with the nobility and shyness which he credits to the object of his love. This melodic image and its model keep haunting him ceaselessly, like a double idée fixe. This explains the constant recurrence in all the movements of the symphony of the melody which launches the first allegro. The transitions from this state of dreamy melancholy interrupt by occasional upsurges of aimless joy to delirious passion, with its outbursts of fury and jealousy, its return of tenderness, its tears, its religious consolations, all this forms the subject of the first movement. And that, keep an eye on that phrase, ide, or on this, yeah, on this phrase, ide fix. It, that means a fixed idea. There's going to be a certain little ditty in this entire symphony that is going to serve as the foundation for the whole symphony. And whenever you hear that ide fix, it 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 um it it's meant to allude to the girl that the artist is in love with. And I know what the ide fix sounds like, so I'll point it out when it comes. All right, here we go. Now this symphony is pretty special because um this is like one of the first symphonies to have like a mega symphony or a mega orchestra. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, I can't see it now. It went black. There we oh, there you go. I had a look at the thing. Yeah. No, they no all the music all the strings right now they have this is a concertino which means the the violins and the violas all the strings they have mutes on as you can see on their bridge they have this little thing yeah that's a that's a concert mute 
it creates this really like queasy dreamy effect it's meant to make the instrument quieter but in symphony fantastic it makes it sound like really dreamy yeah that that concert mute I have a nice Nice pizzicato for the bass. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> they're all wearing bow ties. Oh, the. Uh, no. The, the guys are, finally. Thank goodness they are. Because <laughs> the guy in the last street, in the, in the last video. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I really wish the conductor would too, but hey, you can't have them all right. Yeah. Nah, he not French. This is a French piece, I think. So, um, oh, oh, no, oh, 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 yeah, so you, you probably already know that uh, all the strings tune to the oboe in the orchestra. Yeah. <laughs> really? Well, I don't know about the woodwinds, but if that's true, hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Nice vibrato. Good vibrato. Oh, that's normal. Uh, and uh, for this uh, symphony, two, uh, the clarinet is required to have two clarinets on hand all the time, I think. Uh, yes, because um, I think it has to do with the range of the instruments. You have to have a A clarinet and a B flat clarinet next to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's the most popular one from what I've seen. It's B flat clarinet. No, he's using a. Oh, he's using a French bow. I'm sure that wasn't a she. I I I can tell. Let me see. I just saw the day two strings, that's why. Yeah. I think we just missed the E Day fix. Oh well. Oh, Whoa. I'm sorry. No, that's alright. I, I should have caught it. It's really low. Is there a way we can turn the volume up? I don't know if I if it's on my end I gotta turn it up. Oh wait, I think I there we go, I can hear it now. I had to turn it up on my end. It's alright. Okay. Maybe they couldn't hear me. There we go. Man, that, that must suck, because then people were like, what the f*** is he saying? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Oh, 
There it is. There it is. That's the E-Day fix. Mm. There it is. That's it. That's the E-Day fix. So whenever we hear this, the artist is thinking about the girl or he sees the girl. Glad we didn't miss the E-Day fix. That's the most important part of this symphony, is that E-Day fix. <laughs> oh, probably there's one. Yeah. <laughs> Oh wait, there is actually a yeah, third clarinet in this one. I forgot the E flat clarinets in this one. Really? Yeah, the little piccolo uh, clarinets in this one. Oh, I see. Yeah, they got some clarinets there. Yeah. <clears throat> There it is, not the ED fix again. In a very, very, in a varied form. I've tried to sight read this thing before. It's a hard piece. I can believe it. Yeah, this thing is hard to play. Especially because this piece in particular does not use a formal uh, phrase structure. Or organ or um, symmetrical phrase structure. So uh, all the phrases in this piece are not a a nice cut and dry four bar phrase. It's gonna be like a, like maybe five, then two, then three. But hey, that's what that's what you do when you're on drugs, right? <laughs> that is, I guess. Yes, I haven't been on any. Except maybe the clinical ones like Uterol. Uh, uh -huh. uh, well, the uh, when Berlioz was writing this, he was on opiums when he was writing this. All right then. Well. <laughs> yeah, he was on opium or opiates when he opiates was writing this. <laughs> Man, that dude, he's just enjoying. Yeah. <clears throat> Now the the size of the orchestra. Oh, that is uh, definitely, oboes. huh? Those are oboes. Yep. Okay. Yeah, the size of an orchestra like this was probably um, a new thing in Berlioz's day because Berlioz was also the first composer to really formalize the um, art of um, orchestration. Yeah, I think he wrote. I think he might have wrote a book on orchestration. And for something like this, he probably would have had to, because um, using a mega orchestra like this was not common in his day. Yeah, this was a new thing. I completely have respect for. Because he's just willing, he's just commanding these things. Yeah, it takes a lot of knowledge from the composer uh, to know how the instrument, all the instruments work in the orchestra. And if there's a problem, he's got to learn how to f how to fix them individually. Tell who to back off and who to. Yeah. Yeah. Now, interestingly enough. Hector Berlioz was not a pianist like a lot of composers are. He was a trumpeter. Oh, really? Yeah, he, he played the trumpet. And, it, and I think he, he was happy he never started on piano. Because I think he said it made him more creative and free as a composer. To be a trumpet, at least. Yeah. <laughs> I 
Now, I don't know if Brahms would have liked this piece. But, uh... You know, this is still one of the most iconic pieces in classical music to this day. Or right now, we're well into the symphony. The, the, the main character of the story of this piece is probably really high right now. Yeah, he's he's high. Than a kite? Oh yeah, high as a kite. I actually want to look up the instrumentation for this orchestra. Maybe you can share your screen. Oh, there we go. Is he on absent? I. That's a drug. Yeah. <laughs> Is he on basalt doing this? <laughs> nah. So let me see. Instrumentation. Okay. Oh man, this is a big list. Um, so, the score to play this piece uh, requires... Uh, let's start with the woodwinds. Requires two flutes, one doubling piccolo, two oboes. One of them has to be... Or one doubling corps anglais. In movement three, the first oboe is placed briefly offstage, okay? Oh, there's an offstage player, okay. Really? Yeah, two clarinets... One doubling E flat clarinet. I see it. Four bassoons. Okay. Alright, for the brass, um, four horns, two cornets, two trumpets, three trombones, and two ophicleides, or whatever. Uh, but Fiddles? the modern. What? Fiddles? Um, um, we'll, we'll get to the fiddles in a second. Okay. Um, but in modern performances, we'll use tubas for this. Um, all right, percussion. Four timpanis, okay. Uh, cymbals, snare drum, used in movement four, of course. Yeah, oh. uh, well, well, there's a reason for that. You'll see why. In movement four. Well, we'll wait. We'll wait. But we'll get to there. And then bells. Oh, yeah. There's a reason for that one, too. <laughs> yeah. You'll, uh, you'll see that the drugs really kick in on movement four. And you, you'll see why. Right, by that time. Yeah, go on. By the, by the by movement four, drugs have really kicked in. I he's he's are baked. Bass, are there bass clarinets? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there are bass clarinets in this piece. It's not list listing them here, but uh, this is a modern performance. So they may be using bass clarinets. Alright, strings. Uh, this piece requires two harps. Um, violin section 1 and violin section 2. Viola section. Uh, cellos and double basses. Okay. Alright. Okay, over. we can uh, we can pause here, and I will read the next part of the program. Okay. So we're on movement two now. So, movement two is the ball. So he's going to a dance. So here's what the program says. Sorry, hold on. Let me uh, for the chat. Let me get rid of this one thing. The yeah. Transparent. All right. Yes. All right. So movement two. Here's what the program says. The artist finds himself in the most diverse situations in life, in the tumult of a festive party, in the peaceful contemplation of the beautiful sights of nature. Yet everywhere, whether in town or in the countryside, the beloved image keeps haunting him and throws his spirit into confusion. And that's, that's what the program says for Movement 2. Mm -hmm. So it's going to have like a, it probably is going to have a nice 1, 2, 3 kind of feel. Okay. All right. One, two, three. All right. Let me get that thing back up, the transparent, and then we shall get back to it. Let's do it. Man.
I imagine it's gonna be a, a it's gonna be in three because if we're at a ball, yeah, I imagine. And the E day fix is gonna come back, but it's gonna be in three this time. It might be in 6-8, though. It's a nice tremolo. Three, one, two, three, one. One, two, three. Yep. Yep, I knew they would do this. 6-3? Sorry, 6-8? One, two, three, one, two, three. I, I imagine it's my... Uh, let me check the score so I'm not wrong. But it's either going to be in 6-8 or 3-4. Or 3-8 if it were... Or... Yeah, it might be 3-8. Yeah, let me get the... Let me get the score itself. On IMSLP. There's a harp, everybody. Yep. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two... All right, let's pull up the score. One, two, three, one. I always found when playing uh, music, counting in three sometimes gets hard. One, two, three, one, two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three. three. There, there's the E day fix. <laughs> Can you imagine so, yeah, one. So the the artist sees the girl at the ball right now. Uh, so okay. what are we gonna say? I, I was going to ask when he shook his head, do you imagine that he's like, no, this is crap, better? <laughs> yeah. Imagine that? Uh, he might be able to do it, but uh, this is such a busy piece sometimes that he may just have to concentrate on the music. But yeah, if there's a free moment, if you mess up, uh, I've seen conductors. I've, I've seen, I remember one conductor, uh, where they were playing in like Beethoven Symphony 8, mm -hmm. I believe. And some, one of the brass made a mistake, and the conductor had enough time to just look at him and just shake his head like, Really? What was that? <laughs> yeah, it, no, he didn't say He didn't say it, but you could see it on his face like, Bro, what was that? That's, what in the world did you just do? Oh, well, what do you know? This, uh, this movement's in 3-8. Aha! Ooh, it's in one. Two, three, two, three, one, two, three, two, three. Yeah, when when you play in three eight, you know it's fast. Bunch of quarter notes and sixteenth notes, right? Um, a lot of uh, eighth notes and sixteenths. Quarter, my butt. It's too long. Quarters. <laughs> uh, the quarter notes are a long beat, or a long, uh, or is a long note in a piece like this. Yes, they are. Yeah. Two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three. So I almost imagine with this movement, it's like uh, the the artist is trying to get near to the girl and ask her for a dance. But he's either like too he's either too scared to do so, <laughs> or he just can't get to her. Oh, did we shift meter? We no, we didn't shift. Uh, no, no, we didn't. No, we didn't shift meter. 
For a second I thought we did, but nah. We just sped up the tempo. Two, three, two, three. Yeah, we sped up the tempo. There's that E-Day fix again. Yeah, boy. So at this point, the girl either ditched him or he just couldn't get to her. Who knows? Lame. Lame! Guess he wasn't a mega Chad, but I'm joking. <laughs> well, I mean, he's high right now. He's baked. He's probably think he's a Chad in his own mind. Yes! You know what, for, I, I will admit, for uh, the main character in this piece, he has like the, he has the most crazy, he has some crazy visions. He's got some crazy hallucinations. Mm. What is, alright, that's movement two. Alright, let's pull out the program again. Right, let's see on. what it says for movement three. Hold on, let me uh, go... First, I need I would like some. Hold on, maybe you can announce it to the chat, and I will get something to eat and restroom. Hold on. Ready? I'll wait for. I'll wait for you. I actually can't see the chat, so I don't know if anyone's commenting right now. Do do do. <sighs> All right, so this move uh, actually what's interesting is that this symphony has five movements. Normally, a lot of symphonies only have four. So for a piece like this to uh, have five movements, it's unusual. Well, I wouldn't say actually no. This is not unusual because it's a more of a programmatic piece. It's not so much as a symphony as it is a, a programmatic, like, uh, tone poem, I guess. But I don't know if I'd call it a tone poem. It's just one of those programmatic um, pieces that's played at uh, concerts. I liken it almost to, like, a Richard Strauss's uh, A Hero's Life. Though I don't know the program for that one. That one would be interesting to look up. <laughs> Alright, I'm back. Oh, I'm sorry. Hello. Hello. Yes. So, uh, did you? Well, uh, okay. I haven't read part. I haven't read uh, part three of the program yet. I was waiting for you. Oh, really? So it's uh, just been yeah. silent this whole time. Uh, a little silent. I was talking to the chat about uh, uh this is this piece in particular. Um, it's 
it has the word symphony in its title, but it's unusual that it, because this symphony has five movements as opposed to the traditional four. Mm. But I wouldn't really call this a formal symphony per se. I would say it's more of a programmatic tone poem, like uh, Richard Strauss is a hero's life. Um, mm. Or I, I don't know if you'd call that a tone poem either. The Faust Symphony would be, or yeah, the Faust Symphony and the the Dante Symphony would are tone poems. Okay. Or oh, the Dante Symphony, that one's amazing. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious! If we do another one of these, the Dante Symphony is an absolute beast to cover. All the right, thing sure. is, the thing is, ah, uh, man. But either way, back to Symphonie Fantastique. All right. So part three, scenes in, scene in the countryside. One summer evening in the countryside, he hears two shepherds dialoguing with their rons de vaches, forgive my French, uh, this pastoral duet, the setting, the gentle rustling of the trees in the light wind, some causes for hope that he has recently conceived. All conspired to restore to his heart an unaccustomed feeling of calm and to give to his thoughts a happier coloring. But she reappears. He feels a pang of anguish, and painful thoughts disturb him. What if, what if she betrayed him? One of the shepherds resumes his simple melody. The other one no longer answers. The sun sets. Distant sound of thunder. Solitude. Silence. And that's movement three. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I had to unmute myself. All right. Let me be transparent and we shall begin to play again. Mm -hmm. So when we hear the E Day fix, it's kind of like um, uh, light motifs that are used in like Star Wars movies. So whenever Darth Vader appears on the screen, the Darth Vader uh, theme ple uh, plays. Still, in a way, this Ide Fix is a light motif, which John Williams is so fond of using. Hmm. Especially in Star Wars. So there's the shepherds playing. I actually want to see when the, where this piece had its first premiere. She's ready. Overview. That's that's an oboe, right? Uh, rewind it. A little. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. That that uh that is a coranglay. So it's like an oboe, but a little bigger. Mm. Uh, it also n goes by the name English horn. English horn. Mm. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Caught what the guy was thinking. He was like, "Yup, let's get ready." Yep. Movements. Let's see. Ah, oh, that's funny. That's real funny. They say this thing is in the key of C major. I bet he shifts key all the time. Well, actually, no. This one be. Too much of a stretch for him to keep it in the key. It was still the 1830s. I just doubt it with Berlioz, but I haven't studied his music as much. So people were... Well, it doesn't surprise me they were using drugs in the 1830s. Yeah. Um, 
I find it I find it amazing that Berlioz could write this whole thing on opiates. Seriously. I just wonder how he manages it. I know Mozart. I've heard rumors that Mozart would write music when he was drunk. And I imagine that's hard to do. But I... being on like but being baked on drugs? Yeah. Drunk, I would think. I don't know, really. That's what I've heard. Um Oh, apparently there's a sequel to Symphony Fantastique. Really? Yeah, Berlioz wrote it. Um, in 1831, there was a um, there's a sequel to this Symphony Fantas Fantastique called uh, Lelio. Hmm. That one with the uh, red hair and the flower thing in her hair. She was just staring at one of the other. Composers. I sorry, one of the other people in the violinist. Um, that's that's not a surprise. Um, if you're probably gonna be looking to the violin section a lot in orchestras because uh, the concert master is gonna be in violin section one. And he sets the tone. He oh. basically is like this orchestra second in command, and he telegraphs what the conductor wants. Okay. Yeah, did you see her? No, I didn't see her. That one. Oh, her? Yeah, she was looking over at either him or her. Oh, oh yeah, that's in the direction of the uh, of the concert master. So yes, that's completely normal for her to be looking that way. Got it. She she looks to the concert master for guidance because he'll also set the beat sometimes, or he'll also uh, solidify the tempo. In the clarinet section, we had the same thing too. Really? Yeah. But you would listen for that. Like, hey, they're, you know, they're playing a certain way. Therefore, I should play a certain way. I should play stronger. I should play weaker. Follow his lead or her lead. Follow the person. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's basically what you, that's basically what the strings do for the concert master. <laughs> I want to find out when this, where this was premiered. piece or this concert uh when this was i want to find out the concert this was first debuted in let me look down um, i don't know if it's gonna have the first debut there ah uh, this video was uploaded then there we go live recording 2013 oh i meant when this was uh first performed oh. historically I know it was performed in 1830. Now, let me see. Let's see. Oh, really? What? The this piece had its first performance at the Paris Conservatory on the fifth of December. Oh, so this was performed in Paris, okay? That makes sense because this was a French composer. Everything's like in French. Look at that. Yeah. And also plenty of the comments. Check this out. Yeah. What can I say? Hector Berlioz is is a is a giant uh -huh. in like in like classical music. More more near the beginning of the Romantic era, though. But you have to you have to keep in mind this piece was performed three years after Beethoven died. Really. Yeah. And Beethoven was a juggernaut. Oh, I know. He he changed he changed the way music is done in the world. So 
People were probably feeling, feeling pretty inspired. Therefore, he turned to his magic substances, huh? Yeah, uh, Beethoven? No, this guy. Oh, his opiates? Yeah. <clears throat> That's a strange flute. Oh, there's the E-Day fix. Yeah, I would have done that too for Tremolo. Which was again? Forgive me, remind me. Uh, they, they took their pinky off the bow, and uh, yeah. I would do it if I was probably... I would probably do that too. Although I haven't been doing it lately, I should probably do that because that would make it easier to trim low. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. You've heard this? Yes, I have. Yep. I wouldn't be surprised. This is a famous. This is a really famous piece in um in the classical uh, genre. What? They're pressing on it with they're pressing on the thing the strings with their fingers. Oh yeah, that's pizzicato. Okay. The square. What? The square pin holders. Uh, not pin holders. Uh, I forgot what they're called. The reed holders. <laughs> square yeah. Holders. Those are going Oh, really? But that's apparently what the masters use. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me get the score for this thing. What is it in? Oh, it's in 6-8? No, it can't be in 6-8. We must have changed meter. Yeah, we have to have changed meter somewhere. Where we changed meter. There's no way that this is not in 6 8. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think you're right. No, no, there's no way this is in 6 8. Apparently, it's in 6 8. I'm shocked. How though? <laughs> Looking at the score, I do not see any changes in meter, which- Oh, wait, hold on. Is it? No. I'm surprised, though. There, there has to be- There has to be two notes. There has to be an indication for uh, eighth notes, then, in this thing. Or with, with a simple subdivision, because, uh... 
it does not sound it does not feel like it's in the six eight unless the oh, there's you there's that e day fix again yes dude that composer he's just uh, the conductor's just he is in it man yeah now something color wise with that flu must be in bra yeah. bronze really it must be no must be oh you, you know a, a really good um symphony to review would be brahms first symphony mm. that thing is a that thing is amazing how about brahms, next uh, music review we do that brahms first uh first symphony yeah how about we do that next one yeah, that could that could be one we do. Brahms' first symphony is amazing. Yeah, I I would one. I would argue it's his best one of the four. Mm. He spent over ten years working on that thing. Man, I want to get my clarinet fixed. I want to start playing again. <laughs> oh, you should you should come uh you should come play uh. I'm gonna try to audition for the. What is it? The uh, Pasadena Community Orchestra. I'm gonna try to call them tomorrow and see what what they want. Sure. Um. Really? Oh, no wonder I thought it was in. Oh, no wonder I thought it was in a simple meter. He's conducting it in six, not in two. Okay. Makes sense. That's why it sounds like it's in a simple meter. He's conducting it in six, that's why. Alright. Maybe it's the lighting on those flutes. Yeah, the, the flutes look kind of odd. Yeah, I'm thinking brawn. Brat. Bronze. <laughs> I know they look like copper. Yeah, but I don't think they, they are copper. Uh, no, I don't think so. It would have to be bronze. <laughs> I yeah. Would, in my jewelry job, we do our old caster used to cast in bronze, brass, and white bronze and sterling yeah. silver. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, let's pause here, cause uh. This is the beginning of the fourth movement. Actually, no. The fourth movement is uh, later. We're still in the third. At least so yeah. the title says. Are you sure? Uh, play it. Let, let me hear. Because I could swear this is this this might be the fourth movement. But let's see. Let me uh, just play it. Oh. Oh, no. I, okay, yeah. We might be in the third movement still. Yeah, we're still in the third movement. It's my bad. It's all right. Don't worry. It's just I, I I know what comes next and the next move. Oh wait, isn't this the symphony? No, the the next movement is when he kills her. Oh really? Yeah. Tragic again, people. Well, he thinks he's killed her, but he's so high at that point, uh, he can't think straight. Like I said, this whole symphony is just a one humongous psychedelic trip. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> we must get on. Uh, we we must get a third person to review with us. That'd be great. Just uh, get a, get a guy with who, who like who loves weed. It's like man. Uh, Man, I could feel the symphony, man. It's like <laughs> I could feel I could feel Berlioz, man. Him being on all that weed and stuff. Like when I'm on weed, I get transported to places like this too. <laughs> oh, I can tell he's going down. He's like yeah. he's, uh, <laughs> shutting down or what? Oh <laughs> yeah, he, he's tripping. No, 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 wait, wait. There's uh. Something winding down. He's winding up. Like, oh, he's at his yeah. highest. He's winding down now. Oh yeah, he's 
baked at this point. Oh, we just took another shot. You can tell it. <laughs> yeah. Almost to the fourth. Yeah. Oh. Yep, they're getting ready for the next movement. All right, we can pause it here. Okay. So, let's read about the next movement. Okay, so the fourth movement it was, is where stuff... Uh, most people remember the this symphony for the uh, the fourth movement, the fifth movement, and the first movement. So, um, you're probably going to recognize this movement. So, let's read part four. Mm -hmm. Part four. March to the scaffold. He dreams that he has killed his beloved that he is condemned to death and led to execution. The procession advances to the sound of a march that is sometimes somber and wild and sometimes brilliant and solemn, in which a dull sound of heavy footsteps follows with transition the loudest outbursts. At the end, the ide fix reappears for a moment like a, fin a final thought of love interrupted by the fatal blow. Yes, yeah, so in this movement, we are going to hear the E-Day fix one more time. And when we, when it suddenly goes away, that means his head's chopped off. Oh, really? Yes, but keep in mind, the guy's completely okay because he's just, he's just hallucinating right now. Mm. Yeah, this is where the drugs are really kicking in. Well, all movement right. four. Uh, yeah, I, I'll just preface it like this: Movement four and movement five are where the drugs really kick in. And by movement five, the drugs. It, oh, it's it's bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'll see though. All right, let's hear movement four. Let's do it. Uh, this movement's pretty cool. Not gonna lie, this one has a really nice theme to it. So in this movement, the artist it, thinks he's killed his beloved, and now he's being marched to get his head chopped off. Tragic. Yeah. He was a total victim here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Joking. He's... Dude. Yeah. I love this movement. The fourth? Yeah. Uh... Okay. So you can feel that one, two, one, two. It's kind of like representing him marching to the scaffold. <laughs> wow, I'm surprised they're using that many bases. Probably have to, but that is a lot of bases for this, something like this. Yeah, right. Uh, those might be bassoons. Okay, yeah, there we go. Because the way the shape, I'm like, that's not... Yeah. Still. 
Well, let me check what meter this is in. I I'm gonna imagine this is in like six eight um, two. No, it has to be in like it has to be two something. Let me see. Okay, it's in two two. Yeah, I thought because I'm like one two one two. Actually, I was one one two three. So, so, so one and two and three and four and one and two and three. And Actually, no, it's in two. It's like one and two and one and two and one and two. And two and two. Many of these people look like actors. Oh, yeah, this. That they do. Orchestras do will practice their theatrics sometimes. Oh no no, I mean like uh, what, the blonde trumpetist right there. He looks like the yeah. dumb and dumber. Yeah. The guy with the, the not the chimes. What is it called? Oh what? That's impressive. How can you spiccato that high? Nice. Go offs. Oh, he's he thinks about the E Day fix, and then yes, chop. His head's chopped off. Really? That that's the moment where his head's chopped off. Okay. And then we have a nice little happy chord. To celebrate his head, it's chopped off. It's over? Oh, it's not over yet. Okay. We still have to wait for the drugs to kick, the drugs to really kick in. All right, movement five. All right. Are you ready for some serious drugs? Yes. Here we go. All right, part five. He see dream of a witch's Sabbath. He sees himself at a witch's Sabbath in the midst of a hideous gathering of shades, sorcerers, and monsters of every kind who have come together for his funeral. Strange sounds, groans, outbursts of laughter, distant shouts which seem to be answered by more shouts. The beloved melody appears once more, the Ide fix, but has now lost its noble and shy character. It is now no more that than a vulgar dance tune, trivial and grotesque. It is she who is coming to the Sabbath. Roars of delight at her arrival. She joins the diabolical orgy. The funeral knell tolls. Burlesque parody of the diacire. Oh, okay. The dance of the witches. The dance of the witches combined with, with the diacire. Okay. Dang. So basically, this this movement's now Witch's Sabbath. <laughs> so, so he's so in this so in the final part of his uh, drug trip, he is dreaming of his funeral, and a bunch and the people who have arrived to his funeral are a bunch of crazy witches and <laughs> monsters and whatever. <laughs> welcome, yeah, to hell. yeah, welcome, welcome, to, welcome to opiates. Yes. Population, you. <laughs> <laughs> Mood, <laughs> radical. <laughs> <laughs> that is good. Oh, wait. Oh, I am so sorry. I didn't un undo the transparent for the chat. So they're just like, we just see the girl. Can't see the thing. Let me show them the title. Movement five, everybody. No, you yep, which is Which is Sabbath. Which is Sabbath, everybody? Yeah, boy. Oh, All right, let's let's switch and let's listen to some witchcraft. <laughs> Absolutely. Let me get that. Dude, this guy is he's into it. All right. Yeah. Now apparently there's gonna be a DSRA in this. All right. So. I wonder if it's going to play the Mozart DSCRA. Beethoven just died, right? Three years um, ago. Yeah, during the composition of the performance of this piece, Beethoven would have died three years ago. Okay. 
Oh, the tiny flute. Uh, oh, it's piccolo. piccolo. There we go. Yeah, piccolo. Yeah, Beethoven died in 1827. This piece was performed in 1830. Okay, and it's sequel 31. Yeah. I wonder what the sequel is. I've never looked up Lelio. Next time we'll do that, I guess. That or what other one do we agree on? Um, Brahms Symphony 1. We'll do, yeah. Wh whichever is your choice, my man. Next time we'll do I, that. Yeah, I've never looked up Lelio. Uh, whenever we do it next, uh, I'll try to make sure I look up Lelio and try to listen to it. <laughs> nice. That dude looks like an actor. I forgot his name. Uh... It looks like Will Ferrell. Really? Kind of does. The the clarinet looks like Will Ferrell. He has the hair like him. I yeah. Was gonna say... Nah. I was gonna say Taylor Kitsch, but nah, nah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Will Ferrell. <laughs> oh yeah, that's Will Ferrell. Uh, let's see. Um, no, not Taylor Kitsch. Who's that one? Who? Uh, oh, that yeah, Will Ferrell. Oh. Yeah, it looks like Will Ferrell. He's from a TV show. He also was in uh, Quiet Place. Oh. Yeah, the dad from Quiet Place. Yeah. <laughs> you see that? Yeah, I just saw that. <laughs> someone good. was someone must have messed up. That is good. Oh shoot, who's who's on top? Those 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 audience members? Yeah. Really? Oh those oh the bells. That's a Oh, that is a good imagery of the funeral. Oh those Oh, that definitely is the the church bells. Jason J J Jason Statham, everybody. Yeah. T S E R A. Yeah, there's the D S E R A. I think. Yeah, boy. Mm -hmm. Oh wait, you know what? Yeah. Easter's coming up. Maybe we should do an Easter-themed piece. I think that'd be nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um. There's a few good ones. Uh, Handel's Messiah. That's a that's a really good one. Should we uh, on Sunday? Yeah, if you want to do it on Easter Sunday, we can. Sure. I have the day off that day, so yeah. Uh, we could also do Box Easter Oratorio. Nice. But um, I think everyone's going to know Handel's Messiah, but that one's super duper long. That one's three hours long. Really? <laughs> Yeah, that one's that one's ridiculous. Is each piece an hour long? No, the Handel's Messiah is split into three parts. Part one is the prophecies of Jesus. The second part is the Christmas part, and then the third part is the Easter part, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the life, de birth, and death. Kind yes. Like death slash resurrection. Yeah. No, no, life would include the death. So, yeah. The life, birth, and resurrection. Yeah. But it's passive. Yeah. Maybe we should have done something. Eh, oh well. Oh, let's have a look at the meter for this. Yeah. 
it's gone up, right? One of the two. You must have. Yeah. Oh, actually, my. Oh yeah, it's gone up. Yeah, I, I think I feel like it increase. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we're in six eight right now. Okay, I was close. One of the two the one of the two one of the two one the two Copyright, that's why I'm talking. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's see. Ooh. Is that a... She's using a coon there. Or she's using coon, uh... Screws. That's interesting. That one surprised me, though. Can each one coon. be... Made out of different wood, or they have to be the same wood. Um, that I'm not too sure about. Um, oak versus redwood. Yeah, they're probably made of different woods, but probably. Let me see. Let me check just to make sure. Pine, maybe. All right. Let's see. Let's see. Spruce, willow, maple, ebony, and rosewood. Okay. Way off. Uh, yeah, so most violins will use one of the these uh, these five woods. Okay. I wonder what palm tree wood would be like. Uh, oh! Yeah. Interesting. Do you see that? Uh, please specify. Okay, so you just see how the wood, the 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 wood of the bow is hitting the strings. Yes. That is a special. That is a special stroke that is not oftenly used. It's col colenio colenio. That is a very rare stroke. Okay. Um, and there's a reason why it's rare. Because, um, that stroke actually has the potential to damage the bow. Really? So, yeah, it is used- that technique is used very sparingly. <laughs> that is not oftenly done, but when it's done, it's used very sparingly. What yeah. Oh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was gonna ask what part in the story are we at? Uh, um, at this point, probably just, it's probably just the funeral still, this witch is Sabbath day, I think they're kind of celebrating he's dead in his own hallucination. Nice. <laughs> yeah, that is Symphonie Fantastique. Oh man, I don't know if I should take the filter off, no, I'll keep it on. Yeah, of course. Conductor gets off stage and he comes back out. I'm assuming he's the concert master. Is he gonna speak or? No, they the in a in a in a concert setting like this, um, 
you don't really speak. Now you see that the conductor is bowing but no one else is. That is that is a that is a common practice. The the and on behalf of the orchestra the conductor bows for them. Mm. Oh right, yeah, because um well well sure we're familiar with it, but I forgot whoever will watch this isn't. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I I have, yeah. There's the concert master who is shaking his hand. Who is the second one? The the second what? The person he shook her, he shook her hand after it was. Um, maybe it's the associate concert master. Uh. But he usually shakes the hand of the concert master. Now, if there is an associate, yeah, he'll shake her hand, too. Very nice. Yep. Oh, please don't let there be a commercial on. Oh, all right. Let's see. Let's go back. Should I stop uh, the cast, the, st the streaming? The uh, not the the actual video, but for Discord streaming. Should I stop that one or? Oh yeah, you can stop that one if you want. Oh, so, right. uh, I don't know if this is your first time hearing this, but what do you think of it? Um, the whole thing. I believe it's my first time, but uh, part three. Uh, let me see. Movement three, I have heard. I uh, yeah. movement four, I have heard parts. Yeah, Th those are the only parts I'm familiar with. Everything else, uh, all new. I'm surprised you didn't. You haven't heard uh movement five, the witch's Sabbath. That one's usually pretty famous. Wait, let me think about it. Because I know Bugs Bunny does movement three or four, one of those. Um. Yeah, because he was doing one of those, I believe, or yeah. somebody else. Uh, but I saw them in cartoons, and I've seen them in movies. What was the third? What, what was the fourth one sound like again? Um, it's a dum, dum bum. A, oh yeah, dum bum dun da da dum. Dun, 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 dun. No, you're right. I've, yeah, I've I've heard this in movies before. I'm thinking. I'm not too sure. It can't be Home Alone, because uh, when he's watching a movie, it, it can't be Home Alone. It's yeah. not one of those scenes. It's a different movie, but it was for sure in one of the movies I've seen before, where there was yeah. a concert and they were listening. I'm like, oh wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Symphony Fantastique is. Definitely one of those pieces in classical that, um, if you're a diehard fan, you know this piece, period. It is, um, it's, I think it's really the first programmatic symphony, period. Mm. And, uh, man, uh, man, does that mean it predates Wagner? Maybe it does, let me see. I so know Wagner was big on story programmatic music. Let's see. Hmm. Richard Wagner. What was your favorite part of this of that whole well, piece? I think it's always gonna be movement for the march to the scaffold. I always love that that really intense feeling as he's walking down the scaffold. Let's see. I wanna see. I want to see if this thing predates Wagner. Kind of does, doesn't it? Because he was born in 1813. Died 83. Okay. <laughs> I paused it on this man's face. Let me show you. Yeah. 
see. Hey, what the? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's funny. That is good. So in this part, so hold on, let me. Is that the part? Um, why don't you click on movement four on the time code? This is movement four. Oh yeah, oh, why don't oh. you just rewind it? Yeah, it's just click on the time. Yeah, just just click on the time code. And then. Yeah. That one there. That's his walk. Yeah. Yeah, this is the walk to the scaffold. It's a. Uh... If I'm not mistaken, that's the violas and the cellos that get that part. That does not sound like the violins. Mm. I always love that part. walking or are they is he being prepared right now well at this point it's probably he's probably still walking to it really maybe <clears throat> yes i guess it's all up to your interpretation at this point i would imagine if we were to watch this in a movie yeah he would still be walking to the scaffold No, that's alright. It's a. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this. Oh, like a few minutes long. Yeah. Well, it's. It's like, you go. Uh, yeah! Yeah, <laughs> yeah this, this, this is one symphony that's not easy to conduct. <laughs> That's uh, Berlioz, like I said, doesn't use a, a symmetrical um, phrase structure. So everything's gonna sound, so all the phrases are gonna be uh, different lengths. Some of those instruments get polished. Yeah. Actually, for this movement, though, I bet this it had to be a little more structured. Face. Yeah. <laughs> I so where you saw that one rare key, uh, one the rare key stroke that was in um, movement five. Movement five, yeah, that was in movement five. That's uh, that Colenio has not commonly done. You want to fast forward to that? Okay, hold on. I'm putting yeah. my desktop audio. 75% so that way maybe if there's any issues they can hear us if the music was overbearing us. Yeah, I can't. I think there's only been one piece I've ever played in my life that ever had Col Colenio. Oh, okay. So that, that's where we're talking about the pinkies being out. Uh, no, the, that was for a tremolo. He was a, uh, but that part in particular was uh, was really like he was doing spiccato and he was making the ball bounce really high. That's pretty impressive that he hasn't that he's able to still get a good tone out of that and he's able to keep on time. That's impressive. Mm. So again, we just saw the father from A Quiet Place playing the clarinet. Yeah. Chad. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Alright. So why don't we try to fast forward and try to find that Colenio? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's, it's near the end, I think, of movement five. Uh, let's go here. Let's yeah, let's keep it right here for now. Oh, forwards? Okay. Yeah, uh, keep it right there. It might come up. No. It's glasses, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Those some nice. thick borders on his glasses. Yeah. Oh, that's some nice control of spiccato. Staccato or spiccato? Uh, spiccato. Spiccato. I mean, it is a staccato marking. That one in particular, spiccato. So, are they crescendoing? Yes, they are crescendoing. They are all crescendoing. Let's see. Is this where, he, where he's like, nah, F it? Is it? No. <laughs> really? Okay. Those earrings are just swinging. Stop oh, that! That's that. it? That's the Coleno. As you can see, they're not using their, the horse hair at that point, they're using the wood of the bow. Hmm. Yeah, you want to use that. If you're a composer, you want to use that sparingly. Hold on a second. Yeah. There you go. I think I killed it. There you go. Fly, mosquito? Fly. Okay. After this, do you want to share your screen to show the the piece itself? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, uh, let me let me get it up on IMSLP first. Sure. Because I would like to show. Whoever's watching. Yeah. I'm gonna exit full screen. Alright, let me get it up. Let's see. Is this the whole score? Complete performance. So here's the complete score. Here it is. Alright, I'm gonna pause it. Or should I All keep right. it playing? Uh, you can pause it for now. Let me just get it up on IMSLP. Yeah. I'll stop streaming. Alright. Alright. Uh, Whenever you're just... ready. Alright. Oh, nice. It's in PDF. That's nice. Okay, let me... Wait, is there any copyright with the song? You know, that w we can show the piece, right? Or no? Um, it's public domain, so it's fine. Okay. Yeah, all everything on IMSLP is public domain. Wait, so I didn't need the filter for... No, I know. For the concert, I did. Yeah, for the concert, probably, but for this, no. <laughs> so here's movement one. Let me try to make it bigger. Mm. So, um... Oh, we start out in common time. Flat. There we go with that consordino that the strings started with in uh, movement one with the mutes on. Um, oh, okay, and then they just have the strings playing at that point. Interesting. Oh, there's, those are some notes probably for the conductor. Hmm. Let's see. 
Uh, let's go to movement four, where uh, that's movement three. My goodness. Yeah, this is a, uh, and just think, if you are a conductor, you have to memorize all 148 pages of this. Yeah. Uh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> you have to, like when you are a conductor you have to know these pieces like the back of your hand you are responsible for keeping these people in time and keeping them or keeping the interpretation right so there's a lot there's a lot on their plate so yeah here's march to the scaffold movement four and as you can see that cut time there Mm -hmm. That's what gives it the one, two, one, two. So, yeah, it's definitely a march to the scaffold. And there it is, march, right there, march. 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 Uh, so, please. I'll see, please. Yeah. Oh. Oh, my, that is some whack. That is, oh, that has to be a DVC. The the pizzicato for that in the bass. No way is that a. Uh, no way is that uh no non pizzicato. Yeah, it even says DVC right there. So, yeah, I figured. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's have a look here. <laughs> Anything interesting here? Well, they have rehearsal numbers. That's nice. Hmm. Uh, MF. Probably... What? For, for, I saw MF. Forgive me. Um, remind <laughs> uh, me what that me... is. I really forgot. Uh, MF. Let me see. Um, where, where did you see it? Uh, go up. Yeah. Uh, there's a. Uh... Fortissimo, uh, but then there's the F. Fortissimo is one F. Two uh, F is what again? F, um, so F is forte. Two forte. Fs is fortissimo. There we forgive me. That's that one. Uh, uh, M F is mezzo forte. There we go. Yeah. That's yeah, a that's, softer one, right? Uh yeah, that's medium loud. There we go. Yeah. There, see right there, there's a there's some mezzo fortes right there. So crescendoing to a medium, uh, yeah, to a medium medium volume or medium loud. No, no, volume's good. Yeah, that's what they're crescendo. That's what they're crescendo to, uh, medium loud. And as you can see right here, there these guys are going to a forte. From a forte to a medium loud, right? Um. No, these people up here, they're going from, like, probably medium... Oh, no, they're going from piano or pian pianissimo to a forte. But okay. these guys, they're only going up to a mezzo forte. So these guys are getting loud. These guys are getting medium loud. Okay. Right. Anything else that pops out of the score? Oh, P I Z Z Arco. Uh, piz pizzicato and it's Arco. Cool. So if you play strings, you'll definitely know what this is. So pizzicato means you pluck the string like a guitar. Uh-huh. Or you pluck, yeah, you pluck each individual string. Uh, Arco is return to the bow. That is a very common string uh, thing. It happens all the time. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Anything out of the ordinary? What makes this um a little hard is that we're just skimming through it, but if we ever analyze the harmonic structure, this piece would be so dense and complex. The uh, video? Or the, the stream, I mean? Uh, the music theory behind this piece. Maybe next would... time. 
Oh god, I don't know if I want to try that. That's a, <laughs> that's very advanced to do, <laughs> especially with someone like Berlioz. No way. Mm. Oh, uh, they're all playing in unison rhythm. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Probably it's probably a yeah. nice break for the conductor at that point. Okay. Uh, uh, let me see. What do you Anything think the conductor that... was thinking at that point? You know, as he's uh, looking at the piece, as he's like, oh man, I better do X and Y. What do you think? Yeah, he's probably just thinking, I gotta, I gotta make sure I get these cues on time. I gotta make sure I'm making good eye contact with the performers. I'm making sure that uh, the volume, everyone's balanced. At which point do you think he's thinking those things while looking at this piece? All the time. <laughs> All the time. There's never a moment where the conductor gets a break in something like this. That's why you see him sweating all the time. Yeah. Yeah. The, not Being a conductor is a very hard job. Oh, I believe it. It is a very hard job to have. And... For an orchestra that size, a mega orchestra, oh boy. it's, it's, it, you have to be at the height of your career to probably do something that advanced. Because mm. you can, you can, you can probably conduct a Beethoven symphony and still pretty be, you know, like advanced, but not as advanced. But if you're like conducting like a Berlioz tune like this, you pretty much have to be one of the best out there. Hmm. Um, let me see. I'm trying to see where that um Colenio is. Da, da, da. <clears throat> sempre, siempre, or no, sempre. So faithful, faithful to. Let me yeah, see. yeah, it was. For, yeah, it was further up. There we go. Sempre. Fortissimo. Sempre fortissimo. Always. Always, uh, for, okay. Always at the high. Wait, this is measure five. Measure movement five. No. Yeah, this is movement five. I knew it. Okay. All right. How intense yeah. it got. Yeah. Let's see. Anything else on here that sticks out? Oh, actually, yeah. So the woodwinds, or the flutes, at this point. They're just playing a... Oh, yeah. Okay. So the winds and the top strings are playing the playing the runs, and then everyone else is playing block chords. Okay. Mm. Um, let's see. Anything else? Mm-hmm. <coughs> <coughs> instrument is that is that the bassoon i don't know um <clears throat> oh that's the end okay where is that colenio it will say colenio correct yes it will say colenio uh, do, do, do. Wait, wait, go back. Oh, never mind. Leggiero, Leggiero now. Oh, there oh. it is. So there's that very rare bow stroke. Look at that. My goodness. And, uh... and let's see how many measures they do this for. One, two, three, four. <laughs> oh. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 12. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Yep. Yeah, not even 20 measures. But even then, that's a really long time to do that. Yeah, I could believe it. They probably... People... The, some of those string players were probably crying. Oh, because they broke at some point? No, they're, they're going to damage their bow, and they're crying. It's like, I can't believe I spent all of my money on this bow to use Colenio. <laughs> Yeah, if you're a string player, 
you you know the struggles when Coleño comes up. Especially since the bows can get super duper expensive. I can believe it. Oh, the bows. I remember one time we had a guest in one of our orchestras. And she was testing a bow because she was thinking about buying it. And that bow was around fifty thousand dollars, ten ten to fifteen, ten to fifty thousand dollars. It's a, it was a good bow. It was a really to... good one. I, I could tell. What happened to it? I don't know if she bought it, or if she decided she wasn't gonna take it. Maybe. I don't know, but I think she had to fly all the way from New York, uh, all the way to New York to get it. And then she flew back here to test it in the orchestra performance. She was a professional violinist, so it was probably it was in her best. It's probably common for her to go to New York to test a $50,000 bow. Okay, got it. Mm, let's see. What are the cheapest bows um, that are good and will get the job done? Um, I would say uh, twenty. Well, well, I think we'll get the job done. Well, twenty thousand, maybe. Uh, well, uh, my bow is twenty two hundred, and it gets the job done. Okay. Yeah, you don't need... But does it sound like professional grade? No. Does it get the job done? Yeah. I would say if you want to spend, like, money on a decent bow, you're looking over, like, two th over $2,000. 10000 maybe? Uh, if you want a professional grade bow, yeah, spend 10000 bucks. What is the one you were mentioning that's above 2000 um, the mine or the one that lady was testing? No, the one that you're saying is above two thousand. That's uh, get the job, but that will still get the job I, done. But is I, I was I would say if you want to, if you are a string player and if you want a decent bow that gets the job done, I would say you would you're gonna have to be spending around two thousand dollars or more for a bow, mm. because um at that point uh. They'll get the job done. It'll never sound professional grade, but it will. But it will sound decent enough to get you through a concert. Mm. Lowest uh, for professional grade. Uh, yeah, I would say around two thousand bucks. Two thousand or ten thousand. Two thousand. Oh. Um, if you want, if you want anything professional grade, yeah, get ready to spend money in the ten thousands of dollars. Um, best we make some like, good money. Oh yeah, and like I said, when you're the reason why is Pernambuco wood is very rare to get your hands on. So, when you come across a Pernambuco wood bow, um, you best take care of that bow. You best take care of it because there's not a lot of Pernambuco uh, wood left. Is it because so, the species is going extinct, or no? Okay, so here's the reason why there's a uh, there's a um, serious uh, there's a regulatory thing on um, there's a regulatory statute on um, Pernambuco wood, mm -hmm. and I don't know if it's the United States or if it's the country, some country in South America, but uh, there's. Uh, there's some sort of embargo or whatever that now says you cannot chop down any more um, Pernambuco wood trees to uh, make violin bows. So I think in South America or in Germany, there is this humongous reserve of Pernambuco wood still left. And so that reserve is being used very, very, very wisely to make only like violin, viola, cello, bass bows. Okay. And so when you 
when you get when you buy a Pernambuco bow, you have to understand that not only is it the best wood to use for a violin bow, um, it's going to be expensive because that wood is very rare now. Man. So, if you get yourself a Pernambuco bow, uh, you best take care of it. You best take care of it. Okay, yeah. It's no joke when you have a Pernambuco b a wood bow. No joke. You heard it here, folks. Man. Yeah. Whew. And so as you're watching it, you're you're just uh, thinking these people must be hurting. Yeah, but when you when you see that, when you see them playing Coleño, uh, I'm thinking but the first thing that comes to my mind is that those bows are probably all Pernambuco and they're probably all crying inside because it's like I spent thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on this bow and now I'm damaging it using Coleño. It's not a good feeling. Why do why for Coleño do they want to use the back side of the bow? Cuz that's what the stroke requires. It it's the Coleño requires that you uh use the wood of the bow to hit the strings or to strike the strings. Is it does it really create a that a difference in sound? Um it creates a very percussive woody uh drum-like effect. That the the bow hair will never be able to create. Okay. Yeah, there is the the sound of Coleño. It's a very unique bow stroke, and there's nothing like it. But the trade off is is that um if you use it too much, it will damage the wood on your bow. Which is why some people may resort to using carbon fiber bows so that they do so that the plastic will protect. Or, or the plastic will not get damaged by the the metal strings. Got it. Because you have to th because you have to remember when you play Coleño, if you have a wood bow, it's wood against metal. Yes. So yeah, if you have a wood bow playing Coleño, it's it's you better you better be praying that that Coleño does not last a long time. And That's... and like we see, saw here, it's only seventeen measures of Coleño, mm. and it goes very fast in this score. So, yeah, thirty seconds, maybe fifteen seconds at most. Yeah, and this is the only time in the entire Symphony Fantastique it was ever used. That should be a testament to how rare this bow stroke is, and how hesitant violinists and violists are to play this stroke. Mm. Because uh, if if this stroke is used too much, you you will damage the wood on your bow. I believe it. So, uh, this is this is just uh this is just like a number one lesson to anyone who wants to be a composer one day. When you score when you score strings and you want to use Coleño, use it very very sparingly. It is a stroke that has a horrible trade-off if it's used too much. Mm. And no one, no professional string player will want to play your piece if they see that they have to play Coleño for a very prolonged piece of uh, period of time, they will they will opt out. Are there any pieces that use Coleño a long time? Not to my knowledge. Not to my knowledge. Hmm. Like this this piece and then another piece that I played a while back, those are the only pieces so far I've seen that use Coleño, but there are more out there. Like I said, this stroke is extremely rare. Man, I can only imagine if there's an entire piece that is nothing but Coleño. That's just... Uh, well, let me just say right now, it wouldn't exist. Unless, <laughs> unless the... Unless the Unless you cautioned the comp uh, string players ahead of time, say, like, "Okay, listen, use carbon fiber. 
use a carbon fiber bow because uh, this piece has a lot of colenio in it and you're not going to want to get your Pernambuco wood bows damaged. So bring carbon fiber. Can metal bow bows work or no? I there are no metal bows. There are no metal bows. There's carbon fiber, there's wood. Uh I think there's plastic, like normal plastic. But so far the most common bows are I think um uh, wooden bows and carbon fiber bows. Mm. Yeah, I, think, I like carbon fiber as a material, but yeah, sometimes if you're looking for a sound, I don't know how it compares to wood. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, let okay. So let's talk about that. So, when you're playing a violin, um, you can play a uh. So carbon fiber bows, they will sound uh, they will sound louder. They and they are really good to you. They're really good bows to use because they're lightweight. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the trade-off is is that it sounds kind of inorganic and it sounds uh, almost artificial in the sound. That's why I I like to use a wood bow because the sound is more organic and natural, and it's a lot more uh, pure. When you play a carbon fiber bow, uh, the sound sounds very uh manufactured mm. i found then it ag- yeah go on and then again that is depending on the quality of the carbon fiber but uh go on what were you gonna say i found uh found some videos on carbon fiber versus wood bow yeah hmm. would you like to see or no no that's all right all right yeah uh, let's go back to you all right cool so um yeah. Uh, Any other points of interest? Um, let me see. The probably the scoring of this piece. So let's see: two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets <laughs> in B. Uh, that's the E flat clarinet, probably. I think this is the trombones. Fagati, cornetti, two trombones, timpanis, the strings. Viola. Yep, there's a viola. Okay. Start off very quiet. Yeah. Um. Starts a p and e, uh triple triple Ooh. p. Yeah, that's really quiet. And as you see, there's the concertino for the strings. So yeah, it's going to sound very it's going to sound pretty quiet in the beginning. Yeah, and uh, uh let me see. Largo. <laughs> Large. Okay. Um, uh l- Largo. The movement oh, yeah. one, right? Yeah, Largo. Very slow. 56. That's pretty slow. Mm. No, I ideally I don't think conductor would ever play it that slow I he would well might want to go louder no he would he would conduct it that slow uh louder uh no but uh yeah it's uh Speaking it seems of- like yeah like a normal it seems like a pretty normal score for something at this time period as you were mentioning louder, I just kept thinking louder with Crowder. <laughs> How do you think Crowder would do if he was trying to explain this? <laughs> uh, well, he would have to understand the entire topic first. Well, let's say he did. How do you think he'd do? I think he'd do spectac- spectacular if he did. <laughs> if he knew exactly what he was talking about, he he's he's a really good public speaker. So hey, he he'd know what he's talking about. <laughs> Uh, this, uh, what is it again? The, uh, <laughs> Symphony Fantis, Fantis, Fantastique. F- f- uh, Fantastique. Oh, I'm sorry. What? Fantastique. Fantastique is the best. Change my mind. 
No, I, I would I would disagree with that. There's so many other pieces out there that are a lot better than this one. <laughs> but, this one but this one is one of the most iconic pieces of the Romantic era, probably. Mm. It's definitely a historical piece because I think this was the first programmatic symphony. Mm. So, yeah, this one... This one is always going to be in the academic books. Always. Mm. I can absolutely believe it. Yeah, that's... Yeah, this one's awesome. It's... Wait, was hmm? this in Mrs. Doubtfire for, like, the cartoon portion? I'm not sure. Maybe you would Tom have to Jerry. listen to it. Yeah. And yeah, maybe Tom and Jerry. Yeah. Oh, let me get the picture of the guy who wrote this piece. Sure. So the guy who wrote this is uh Symphony Fantastica's Hector Berlioz, and this is him right here. He French? Yes, he is very much French. Looks like it. I've seen that one before. Which one? This one? No. That one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah Berlioz is uh Berlioz is the first like mega symphony conductor. Yeah, his hair is very iconic. Yeah. It's like a triangle on his head. <laughs> or a shroom. Yeah. Well, I think this photo in particular this would have been the. F this is what Berlioz would have looked like around the time he wrote Symphony Fantastique. Wait, but they didn't have cameras at that time, did they? Yeah, they did. 1830s? Yeah. Oh, all right. Uh, the, to give you an idea, the early. The first, pic the first presidential photo ever taken was um, John right. Quincy Adams. Oh. Yeah, he was the fourth president, right? The sixth. Sixth, forgive me. Fourth was his father. No, the fourth was uh, John, uh, James Madison. The second was his father. There we go. Here's the first uh, photograph of a president ever taken. This is uh, John Quincy Adams. Mm. Uh, let me see if the whole photo... Well, this is a color version of the photo. But yeah, this was the that was the first presidential photo. The second one was Andrew Jackson, but that was when he was already very very old. And here's the original photo. Well, successful failure. What? What? That one picture, John Quincy Adams, the most successful failure. Oh yeah, well. If you know about John Quincy Adams, he he beat Andrew Jackson uh with a back room deal in I think it was the election of eighteen uh what was that? Eighteen twenty four? Yeah, I think that's when he won. He won eighteen twenty four, right? Yeah, he won the election of eighteen twenty four by by a ways, by means of a backroom deal, Andrew Jackson was so angry <laughs> that uh he wiped the floor with John Quincy Adams in 1828. Ooh. Yeah, uh, let me get Andrew Jackson's photo. It's it's really low quality. It's like really bad. Here it is. Okay, yeah, I can I can see it. Yeah, this was his. That was the first. That was I think that was the only photo of Andrew Jackson ever taken. Oh no, wait, there's another one. Here it is. It's like his mug okay. shot. Yeah. Oh, it looks like there was a. <laughs> I have a Trump one. You see yeah. It? He does kind of have the Trump look, though. Oh, no, 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 no. The Trump picture, you see? 
This one? Yeah. Yeah. Man, it's got I don't know, Jackson. I, I do see Jackson a bit of a Trump figure. Yeah. Well, Jackson, Jackson, I, I my one of my history teachers said he was like the first baby kisser. Baby kisser. You know how politicians like to kiss babies. Oh, really? I I, I don't know if they do it these days, but that was like a tradition where politicians kiss babies. I don't know. It's weird, and I don't think we do it anymore, and good thing. <laughs> COVID. Give the baby the coof. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, these are... Let's say absolutely. Yeah. Um... So, uh, let me see. The symphony we were just doing... Uh. Is there any more information we can get on that one? Oh, actually, yes. Um, who he wrote it in inspiration of. So, let me pull it up right now, because the story behind this piece um is a is messed up. So, overview. Inspiration. After attending a performance of William Shakespeare's Hamlet on September 11th, 1827. Oh my goodness. Oh, um. Uh, That's the year your, Beethoven died. Okay. Your stream uh, wasn't streaming anything, so I. Oh, yeah, I, I, I ended the stream. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. So Berlioz fell in love with, an, with the Irish actress Harriet Smithson, who played the role of Ophelia. He sent her numerous love letters, all of which went unanswered. When she left Paris in 1829, they had still not met. Berlioz then wrote Symphony Fantastique as a way to express his unrequited love. Huh. There are many different portrayals of Harriet Smithson throughout the symphony. For example, the harsh narrative of the last two movements can be attributed to her rejection of him during his period of the composition. Smith th Smithson did not attend the premiere in 1830, but she heard the work in 1832 and realized Berlioz's genius. The two finally met and were married on October 3rd, 1833. However, the marriage became increasingly bitter and they eventually separated after two years of, an after years of unhappiness. My goodness. Yeah, the Berlioz was not a good guy. He's he's barely is not a good guy. He's not as bad as uh, what Claude Debussy was like, but uh, yeah, barely else was uh, barely else was not the most admirable person. Uh, Symphony Symphony Fantastique is a piece of program music that tells the story of an artist gifted with a lively imagination who has poisoned himself with opium in the depths of despair because of hopelessness, unrequited love. My, my. Berlioz, Berlioz provided his own preface and program notes for each movement, which I read, uh, of the work. They exist in two principal versions, one from 1845 in the first score of the work and the second f from 1855. From the revived preface and notes, it can be seen how Berlioz later in his life downplayed the programmatic aspect of the work. Hmm. Yeah, so... Like I said, when Berlioz wrote this, he was on drugs while writing it. Hmm. So... Yeah, you can just... Yeah, it's, uh... It's a pretty messed up. It's a pretty messed up story, uh, behind Symphony Fantastique. Wow, wow. That is very informational and uh, very interesting. Absolutely mm -hmm. adored the piece, and this information just it just it just, it just makes the shrooms mm -hmm. come to life. Haha. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely. 
Uh, all right. Well, uh, let me see. It is. I, I don't mean to. It is uh, twelve oh five. Um, do you yeah. have to go or? Probably, yeah. All right, for sure. Let me. Uh, all right. Well. Well, hey. Uh, thanks, Dylan, for the uh, or Harashio for the uh, information. And how'd you feel about uh, the? Hold on. Do I still have that up? No, I don't. <laughs> Good. All right. I got rid of the transparent. Let's see. So h- right. how how'd you feel about uh, reviewing it? Oh, I loved it. Uh, I, I like I said, I could talk about this stuff forever. <laughs> this, is, this is my specialty. Absolutely. And so, uh, so you were thinking on this Sunday we because Sun uh, Easter, that we do an Easter theme one. Yeah, sure. We've got there's a there's a couple out there. So there's the Bach Easter Oratorio. That one's sh- a lot shorter. Um, it's, uh, that one is in German, though, so it'll be hard to understand, but I'm sure there's a translation of the, uh, script somewhere. Um, and then there's Handel's Messiah. Uh, we don't have to do the whole thing. We can just do the Easter portion of it. Um, let me see. Anything else? I mean, there's Russian Easter, but that's only one piece, and that thing goes by fast. (laughs) Do you think we yeah. could do the Russian Easter one and then the Easter portion of the long one? Yeah, I mean we can do we can do Russian Easter, Russian Easter by Korsakov. Mm. Uh, you'll uh, you'll probably recognize it. It's pretty familiar. Mm. Sure. All right. So it's some good old it's some good old Russian music. Mm. For sure. Yeah. All right, and uh, I'll let you know when. When I'll be available, because well, I'm gonna get off of work and then I'll mm-hmm. see if my family is still here at the house. Yeah. Uh, because if that's true, then we'll probably go to my sister's, and then I'll take my computer for going to my sister's. If not, then I guess I'm just alone at the at the house, and then yeah. streaming will be easy. All right. Yeah. Sounds good. For sure. All right. And a uh, question though, um will you be doing anything on Easter? No, not really. Nothing really. Oh, okay, cool. So, all right. All right, yeah. So then um what do you think would be the best time? Um probably in the evening. Oh, actually uh probably in the afternoon. The afternoon. Like around 5? Yeah, around 5. All right. I'll try to uh um I'll see if I'll be available then, because most likely I'll be available between uh, five, you know, or oh, sorry, yeah, starting between five to yeah. maybe seven. Yeah. Yeah, because right. for sure. Oh, right. I yeah. Will. Oh, sorry. Let me. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, um, so. Uh, is, uh, so is there anything that uh, you would like to plug in for the audience here? Oh, well, just uh, thank you for having me. I enjoyed the I enjoyed the talk. Oh, absolutely, and I enjoyed having um I I enjoyed going through this. This was actually pretty cool. Mm. Yeah, it's uh when you yeah this is this is uh, this is uh the story of a lot of classical music. There's always like some really deep stories behind this stuff. Oh yeah, and it's it's just fun you know talking about it and actually getting to know it more. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, definitely. All right, for sure. All right, I'll see you, my man. All right, you have a good night. You too. All right. All right. Bye. Bye. All right, guys. That was Horatio, Lord Nelson. Uh, great guy. I know him in person. Uh, yeah, as you probably heard him say at Perto say last time. Uh, yeah, he, IRL things like that. It's very great. Uh. Let me see, display, capture. And so, absolutely, um, I love doing this. Th- th- this was fun. And uh, hopefully you all had an amazing time for those who were watching. We've been going for about two hours, nine minutes so far. Um, Yeah, things, well, I'm just trying to really end it really on a high note, or at least a good note. But other than that, I hope you guys really did enjoy it. I thought... Like I said to uh, Dylan there, 
that it was pretty amazing, especially how he was on, how he was, uh, you know, high, things like that, writing it up for someone he loves, who eventually divorced, you know, separated from. I just thought that was cool. And hopefully you all thought of you guys so much for watching. I hope you guys have an amazing evening or day, wherever you guys are at. It was fun. And you will get more of this um, coming this Sunday or from wherever it is you're at. Uh, we will be getting some more of this at that time. So as we part ways today, I thank you all for watching once again. I hope. And have a good evening. This has been Kenai24, Enemy of the 25th. God bless you all. God bless America and Godspeed.